The Lord be with you. And also with you. It is, it is so good to see so many of you here today. For those who are here, welcome. For those who are watching us on live stream, welcome. We have a little feedback there. Um, we are glad to be here on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And we continue to pray that God would richly bless us as we live out our lives in service to him. So once again, welcome to all who are here, to our guests. We are pleased that you are with us. I want to mention just a couple brief announcements before we get into our service this morning. On the very back of your bulletin, you will note uh, the section this week at Faith and Grace that Tuesday at 7 p.m., our church council will have an in-person meeting in the sanctuary here. So just again, to, our, to those who serve on the boards and committees uh, of that important day and time. And then on Wednesday at 7 p.m., we have our midweek service uh, here at Faith. And again, it's basically a bit of a repeat of, of what we do on Sunday morning. So again, if you plan on coming, please call the church office to make sure that we can have a spot for you. Uh, also, I would like to announce that yesterday was a wonderful day for so many reasons, but one, of course, was we had a baptism here. And uh, little Rachel was brought into God's family of faith through baptism, and we rejoiced with those who were here. And as well, that we'll have another baptism this coming Saturday here at Faith at 10 a.m. And again, we will keep little Charlie in our prayers and his family as we rejoice together over what God is doing. Other than that, I think that covers the announcements that were within your bulletin. I do want now to just draw your attention to the order of service. It is in paper copy, but it's also on the front monitor. So whichever you prefer to follow, please feel free to do so. Uh, I, I believe everything is enclosed within here for your use, and uh, we don't need to explain anything further, I don't think, at this time. But I do ask that you rise with me for a moment in silent prayer before we begin with our opening hymn. Together we sing hymn 709, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember that you were once separated from Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world. But, but now in Christ Jesus, we who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. You may either now kneel or be seated for this time of confession. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Blessed, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, God King of the universe. For you have commanded, commanded us to confess our sins, and yet, yet have promised your forgiveness. We therefore confess our sins, even those we are not aware of, those we have done, and all that we have failed to do. By your divine command, grant us your forgiveness for the sake of the blood of our crucified and risen shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, when you have commanded your called ministers of Christ to absolve those who repent of their sins. Therefore, upon this your confession, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please rise with me. Last Sunday, as you know, at this time in our service, we have a moment with our children, those who are here or those who are watching from home. And last week we began with this hymn, Go and Tell, and we will once again sing it this morning. begin this message, I'd like to just uh, introduce it with the, these words from the gospel reading from this morning from Mark chapter 6, verse 34, and it reads as follows, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. You know, I still remember when I was very young, my sister, my two sisters and my brother and I would often open up the book called Mother Goose Nursery Rhymes and we would read them together and just uh, meditate upon those wonderful little poems. And perhaps some of you here today have similar recollections or memories. You know the one about Humpty Dumpty who sat on the wall, had a fall, yes, that one. Or how about the one of the three blind mice? That was one of my favorites. Or Little Miss Muffet who sat on a tuffet. But perhaps one of my favorite was Little Bo Peep. Remember how that one went? Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home, bringing their tails behind them. Let's pause there for a moment. Leave them alone and they'll come home. 
Is that good advice? <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of heads uh, shaking that. Yes, yeah, it's not, not really good advice. You know, if you had a flock of sheep and they all wandered off in different directions and got lost, would you just leave them alone and say, that's okay, they'll, they'll come back? No, of course not. You would go out and you would search for them until you found them and then you would bring them back home. Now, I don't know if many of you know this, but if you were to go through the Bible and look at how many times the word sheep appears, you might be surprised to know that it comes out to more than 200 verses contain the, our mentioned sheep. Well, Jesus himself quite uh, compared people uh, to, to sheep. And Jesus said of himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Well, in our Bible reading today, we see that Jesus and his disciples had been working extraordinarily hard. They were very tired. And they've been traveling from town to town, city to city, teaching and preaching wherever they went. The Bible tells us that they were so busy that many times they didn't have time to even eat. Jesus could see that they were tired. And so he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they got into a boat, and they went away by themselves to a quiet place. But guess what? <laughs> when they got to that quiet place, they looked out and they saw a huge crowd of people, thousands of people waiting for them. Now, of course, it would have been very easy for Jesus to, sit, to turn and look at his disciples and say, uh, you know what, we gotta find another place. This is not working out. We're tired, we need our rest. You know, come let's and tell the group to come back another time when it's more convenient. But of course, we know Jesus didn't do that, did he? Rather, we're told in the scriptures, he looked out at the crowd and he said, it says, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What does he had compassion mean? It means far more than just feeling sorry or pity for them. No, it means more than that. It means that when Jesus saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd, he was moved to act. He was moved to do what he can to help. And remember what Jesus had said about himself. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Leave them alone and they'll come home bringing their tails behind them. Well, certainly not Jesus. Not the good shepherd. No, he came to us and he laid down his life on the cross for us. Because we were lost in our sins. And yet he, out of love, divine love, came down from heaven to earth to take those sins away so that we would be his forever. And he continues, doesn't he, to come to us every time we gather to listen to his word or in private when you're reading your Bible at home or whatever other opportunity like that that you have. He comes to us to comfort us. He comes to us to strengthen us. And he comes to us as our good shepherd to care for us. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for sending Jesus to be our shepherd, our king. We are thankful that he never leaves us wandering, lost and alone, without a shepherd to guide us. Therefore, we give you praise and thanks for the truth that we have, that he is our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, please rise with me as we continue now with our introit. And for this morning's purposes, we will speak the introit together with one voice. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, he prepares rain for the earth, he makes grass grow on the hills, he gives to the beasts their food, and to the young creatures that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But, but the, the Lord, Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. 
and those who hope in his steadfast love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We remain standing as we sing our hymn of praise. The Old Testament reading for this eighth Sunday after Pentecost is taken from um, the book of Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Now, Jeremiah pronounced the Lord's judgment of, faithful, of faithless shepherds, the religious leaders of Judah. He said the Lord had decided to be the people's shepherd himself. His words in this particular reading readily project ahead to the son of David who became our good shepherd. The word of the Lord from Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they, will, and they shall fear no more, 
nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Today's epistle is from Ephesians, the second chapter, and can be found in your worship folder as well as on the monitors. Now Paul assured the Ephesian Christians, largely Greeks, that Jesus had removed all lines of separation in the church. And we rejoice that we are included and are reminded that we too must Avoid making surface distinctions that disrupt the oneness of the church. The word of the Lord from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11. Remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you, were, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise with me as we speak the Alleluia verse. Alleluia. Man ate the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. Alleluia. The gospel reading for today is from Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter. In this, it was time for Jesus and his disciples to get away from the crowds for a little while. But the crowds followed him. Jesus taught them all through the day and then blessed them by multiplying the five loaves and two fish and feeding the 5,000 plus. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. <clears throat> now the apostles returned to Jesus and told them him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages, and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, 
you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And then he went out and found out, when he had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise, Praise to you, you O Lord. Christ. You may be seated as we join in singing our hymn of the day, hymn 644.
and peace be unto you from the Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning, as you will note, is the uh, reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. I'm not going to read the whole text, but I want to read just the initial part of it as we begin. Now the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of him. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ, the run. Man, it must have been quite a sight to, to see. As they ran along the side of the sea. You know, it started in a busy little town, perhaps with a few men and teens. But as they ran together, you can imagine more and more people joined in the run. It grew to 50 people. And as they passed through other small villages, these people too joined the run. And soon, there were hundreds. And it continued on growing and growing and growing larger and larger. And by the time the crowd at the full run stopped, there were close to 15,000 people running in their robes, some wearing sandals, others barefoot. These weren't professional athletes preparing for the Olympics or some other event, but they were the people of the towns and the villages. They were carpenters and housewives and fishermen and teenagers, little children, grandparents, all running together to a place where only a hermit would possibly live, running in the rugged landscape that encircles the Sea of Galilee. And imagine, thousands upon thousands of people from the youngest child to the oldest retiree running to a point on the map. But why were they running? To see a preacher? To see him and his 12 road-weary assistants? You know, when we look back, we know who they were seeking. It was Jesus the Messiah. The one whom Peter describes as having the words of eternal life. But back then, what was it that drove them to rush alongside the shore? To hear a man explain God's word? Maybe to see a miracle or two if, they, if they're lucky? 15,000 people running with everything in them. Well, what they saw, more importantly for them, who they saw was how it impacted how he would react. Those are the things that we will now look at in today's sermon. He saw and having seen, he had compassion. Have you ever been so emotionally drained into, or drawn into a situation, pardon me, that it affected you physically. It might simply be that you started to cry because the situation was overwhelming, that you didn't even have the energy to wipe away the tears. You know, it is far more than just pity. There becomes a connection between you and them, a feeling like you have to do something, but there is nothing possible to do. Well, as the boat nears the shore, Jesus sees 15,000 people, and that feeling overcomes our Lord. In fact, the word in the English is that he had compassion on them. In Greek, though, the word is far more forceful than that. It literally means that it overwhelms, starting in the spleen, if you will. One translation, I think, uses our uh, closest term, Jesus saw them and his heart broke. It produced a gut level reaction in him. And these people had no hope. He knew that they had no shepherds to care for them, to guide them toward God. 
Why else would they so desperately seek him out? They were without a shepherd, scattered, destroyed. And so our Lord's heart breaks. He has a real gut-level reaction to the scene of the people of Israel wandering around in their lives. You know, these people aren't supposed to have to run to the middle of the wilderness to hear the word of God. You know, each village had a synagogue with the Torah on scrolls. Each had men appointed as leaders of the synagogues and as scribes who were given the task to, to with much the same job as I have now, to point the people of God to his love for them, to call them back to that important relationship God has always wanted for them to have with him. You know, the truth of Jeremiah's time is still true when Christ takes a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee several centuries later. The people of God are still allowed to go their own way, to scatter in as many directions as possible. In fact, Ephesians 4 pictures this same problem, saying people are tossed about by the waves and blown about by the wind of every new doctrine crafted by humans. Need to justify, pardon me, need a reason to justify this sin or that sin? Well, someone out there has developed the doctrine to do exactly that. You want to seem pious and knowledgeable about Scripture? No problem. There are places that will provide that with special teachings about end times and the secrets of the Bible and never once deal with Jesus dying on the cross to pay for your sins. You can even get so far into the mechanics of the worship of our faith that the mechanics become even more important than he who is being worshipped. Now, meanwhile, meanwhile, the people that God so desires to have a relationship with are killed off, or their faith is killed off, as they are led to believe that there is no need for faith anymore, or repentance, or walking with God. You know, it is enough to make a pastor cry. And it was more than enough to make our Lord's heart break as he taught by the seashore. The people, caught up in their own sin, were so desperate for help that they would run miles and miles through villages and towns, 15,000 strong, to hear somebody who people said was different because he taught as one from God should teach. I think you know me by now well enough to know that I don't believe in coincidences. You know, when, certainly when it comes to the people of God, hearing his word, hearing the gospel. Because I've seen it happen so many times that God has planted for, planned for a person to bump into another person who would then tell them of Jesus. Or that God would put on the heart of one person to call another person and that call leads them to talk about Jesus. You know, God tells the people in Jeremiah's time that he will gather out his remnant from all the places God stashed them. You know, let's look at verse 3 in the Old Testament reading again. He will gather them and bring them back to his flock to be part of his family. He gathers them together. He brings them to hear his voice, his words, and to give them life. On that day in Galilee, he gathered them like a good old-fashioned cattle drive. Picture again, 15,000 strong, running through the hills of Galilee as those hills roll around the sea there. Some saw them and began to run to get to the destination before Jesus. Somehow they recognized where they were going and they took off telling people as they went, calling them alongside to join in the gathering. And God once again, meeting his people in the wilderness, he calls them to him even as he promised his first group of newly trained leaders, the apostles, who were there with him. You know, they were not quite ready, as the next verses will show, but they will become a new kind of shepherd. And seeing his people, the very people of God, gathered there by the Holy Spirit's guidance, but without their shepherds, Jesus now shows that he is the good shepherd. He sits down and he begins to teach them, to instruct them, to tell them what Scripture says. 
Now, I always wonder when it mentions Jesus teaching someone something, what it was that he taught. He, we have examples of his teaching from the Sermon of the Mount to many of his parables. And we have the great conversation on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples when Jesus opened the Old Testament scriptures to those two men. And from Genesis through the histories, from the Psalms and the Proverbs and the prophetical books, he shows those two disciples that he had to die. He had to die on a cross for his people. He had to die on a cross for you and for me. You know, to achieve what we see prophesied in Jeremiah, that God would gather one people and raise up his servant who would reign and save his people. We see exactly how in our epistle lesson this morning, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. You know, and really if that's the depth of Christ's compassion for you and for me. But even though we have been and are far off, he gathers us to himself by the cross and by, by his blood. You know, there's another great Old Testament prophecy. It put this way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every way, everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. You see, for as Jeremiah prophesied, this prophet, this Messiah, who would save his people, is called the Lord, is our righteousness. And it is that righteousness that we find peace the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise with me. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds firmly in faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us now together confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your word, your holy commandments, your holy scriptures, but above all, with your holy word made flesh, your only begotten Son, to be our good shepherd, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. Receive our praise for the gift of your salvation in life. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, 
for you have commanded us to pray. Grant your holy church peace and strength to give witness to your mercy for all people. Bless our nation with faithful leaders who will govern according to your will and righteousness. Sustain all who protect and defend us from all harm and danger, both in the world and in the gift of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Endow your ministers with compassion and grace to reach the lost and to serve your people faithfully with your word and sacraments. Guard and protect them from the assaults of the devil and all enemies of your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And deliver and heal all those who are in trouble, danger, or illness. Especially do we remember this day, Nelson's sister, Charlotte Ann, as she undergoes treatment for cancer for Calvin's sister Cassie during her time of illness, for Suzanne and Jeff and their family as they mourn the death of their mom Irma, for Phyllis and her family as she recovers from surgery, for Bill and for Vicki, Patricia, Sandra, Sarah, Doreen, Grace, Nancy, Marcia, Mark and Elsie, Maria, Karen, Shirley, Marv, Frank and Sarah, Alice, Ryder and Marianne, Stacy and her family, for Delbert, for Alan and for Harry, for Kathleen and Becky and Anna, and as well as for all those who we now name in our hearts. Like a shepherd, lead us all to the still waters and green pastures of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Watch over all those who have received the gift of saving faith through holy baptism, including Rachel, whom you brought into your family of faith here yesterday. Bless her parents, Cody and Amber, with joy as they celebrate the gift of new life that you have given to their little one. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. And visit everywhere the homes of your people with your gracious presence. Especially do we name before you today Carol, Terry, Joanne, Kelly, and Derek, James, and Joseph, and Ruth. May their homes be places of forgiveness, peace, and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And enrich the lives of those celebrating birthdays this week, including Gail, Julie, Dennis, Evelyn, Kat Callie, Jordy, Nikki, Samantha, Ian, and Joyce. Remind them that the gift of life comes from you alone. Bring great joy as well to those celebrating wedding anniversaries this week, including Fred and Liz this day, for Mike and Ann, for Peter and Maria, Walter and Donna, Jordan and Osmila, and Jim and Lillian, that their love will be a reflection of your love for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We conclude our service with our final hymn.
announcement before you depart today. Uh, again, just a reminder that office hours will continue Monday through Thursday, uh, Wednesday here at Faith, 9 till 12. And at Grace, I will be out there this week as Pastor Castillo is on holidays for the next couple weeks. So if you need to see me, please contact the office and we will be happy to set up an appointment. Uh, God be with you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.